Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Allen, and welcome back to another What a Book. We're continuing on in Percy Jackson Van Lampian's The Sea of Monsters. Chapter 7. I Accept Gifts from a Stranger. The way Tantalus saw it, the Stymphalian birds had simply been minding their own business in the woods and would not have attacked if Annabeth Tyson and I hadn't disturbed them with our bad chariot driving. This was so completely unfair, I told Tantalus to go chase a donut, which didn't help his mood. He sensed us to kitchen patrol scrubbing pots and platters all afternoon in the underground kitchen with the cleaning harpies. The harpies washed with lava instead of water to get that extra clean sparkle and kill 99.9% .9 of all germs, so Annabeth and I had to wear asbestos gloves and aprons. Tyson didn't mind. He plunged his bare hands right in and started scrubbing, but Annabeth and I had to suffer through hours of hot, dangerous work, especially since there were tons of extra plates. Tantalus had ordered a special luncheon banquet to celebrate Clarice's chariot victory, a full-course meal featuring country-fried Stymphalian death bird. The only good thing about our punishment was that it gave Annabeth and me a common enemy and lots of time to talk. After listening to my dream about Grover again, she looked like she might be starting to believe me. If he's really found it, she murmured, and if we could retrieve it... Hold on, I said. You act like this... Whatever it is Grover found is the only thing in the world that could save the camp. What is it? I'll give you a hint. What do you get when you skin a ram? Messy? She sighed. A fleece. The coat of a ram is called a fleece, and if that ram happens to have golden wool, the golden fleece. Are you serious? Annabeth scraped a plate of death bird bones into the lava. Percy, remember the Grey Sisters. They said they knew the location of the thing you seek, and they mentioned Jason. Three thousand years ago, they told him how to find the golden fleece. You do know the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, I said. That old movie with the clay skeletons. Annabeth rolled her eyes. Oh my gods, Percy. You are so hopeless. What? I demanded. Just listen. The real story of the fleece. There were these two children of Zeus, Cadmus and Europa, okay? They were about to get offered up as human sacrifices when they prayed to Zeus to save them. So Zeus sent this magical flying ram with golden wool, which picked them up in Greece and carried them all the way to Caucasus in Asia Minor. Well, actually, it carried Cadmus. Europa fell off and died along the way, but that's not important was probably important to her. Th the point is, when Cadmus got to Colchis, he sacrificed the golden ram to the gods and hung the fleece in a tree in the middle of the kingdom. The fleece brought prosperity to the land. Animals stopped getting sick, plants grew better, farmers had bumper crops, plagues never visited. That's why Jason wanted the fleece. It can revitalize any land where it's placed. It cures sickness, strengthens nature, cleans up pollution. It could cure Thalia's tree. Annabeth nodded and it would totally strengthen the borders of Camp Half-Blood. But Percy, the fleece has been missing for centuries. Tons of heroes have searched for it with no luck. But Grover found it, I said. He went looking for Pan, and he found the fleece instead because they both radiate nature magic. It makes sense, Annabeth. We can rescue him and save the camp at the same time. It's perfect. Annabeth hesitated. A little too perfect, don't you think? What if it's a trap? I remembered last summer how Kronos had manipulated our quest. He'd almost fooled us into helping him start a war that would have destroyed Western civilization. What choice do we have? I asked. Are you going to help me rescue Grover or not? She glanced at Tyson, who'd lost interest in our conversation and was happily making toy boats out of cups and spoons in the lava. Percy, she said under her breath. We'll have to fight a Cyclops. Polyphemus, the worst of the Cyclopses. And there's only one place his island could be. The Sea of Monsters. Where's that? She stared at me like she thought I was playing dumb. The Sea of Monsters. The same sea Odysseus sailed through it, and Jason, and Aeneas, and all the others. You mean the Mediterranean? No. Oh, well, yes. But no. <sighs> Another straight answer. Thanks. Uh, look, Percy. The Sea of Monsters is the sea all heroes sail through on their adventures. It used to be in the Mediterranean, yes, but... Like everything else, it shifts location as the west center of power shifts. Like Mount Olympus being above the Empire State Building, I said, and Hades being under Los Angeles. Right. But a whole sea full of monsters, how could you hide something like that? Wouldn't the mortals notice weird things happening, like ships getting eaten and stuff? Of course they notice. They don't understand, but they know something is strange about that part of the ocean. The Sea of Monsters is off the east coast of the U.S. now, just northeast of Florida. The mortals even have a name for it. The Bermuda Triangle? Exactly. I let that sink in. 
I guess it wasn't stranger than anything else I'd learned since coming to Camp Half-Blood. Okay, so at least we know where to look. It's still a huge area, Percy. Some Searching for one tiny island in monster-infested waters. Hey, I'm the son of the sea god. This is my home turf. How hard can it be? Annabeth knit her eyebrows. We'll have to talk to Tantalus, get approval for a quest. He'll say no. Not if we tell him tonight at the campfire in front of everybody. The whole camp will hear. They'll pressure him. He won't be able to refuse. Maybe. A little bit of hope crept into Annabeth's voice. We'd better get these dishes done. Hand me the lava spray gun, will you? That night at the campfire, Apollo's cabin led the sing-along. They tried to get everybody's spirits up, but it wasn't easy after the afternoon's bird attack. We all sat around a semicircle of stone steps, singing half-heartedly and watching the bonfire blaze, while the Apollo guys strummed their guitars and picked their lyres. We did all the standard camp numbers. Down by the Aegon, I am my own great-great-great-great-grandpa. This land is Minos's land. The bonfire was enchanted, so the louder you sang, the higher it rose, changing color and heat with the mood of the crowd. On a good night, I'd seen it twenty feet high, bright purple, and so hot the whole front row's marshmallows burst into the flames. Tonight, the fire was only five feet high, barely warm, and the flames were the color of lint. Dionysus left early. After suffering through a few songs, he muttered something about how even Pinocchio with Chiron had been more exciting than this. Then he gave Tantalus a distasteful look and headed back toward the big house. When the last song was over, Tantalus said, Well, that was lovely. He came forward with a toasted marshmallow on a stick and tried to pluck it off real casual-like, but before he could touch it, the marshmallow flew off the stick. Tantalus made a wild grab, but the marshmallow committed suicide, diving into the flames. Tantalus turned back toward us, smiling coldly. Now then, some announcements about tomorrow's schedule. Sir, I said. Tantalus's eye twitched. Our kitchen boy has something to say? Some of the Ares campers snickered, but I wasn't going to let anybody embarrass me into silence. I stood and looked at Annabeth. Thank the gods she stood up with me. I said, We have an idea to save the camp. Dead silence, but I could tell I had gotten everybody's interest because the campfire flared bright yellow. Indeed, Tantalus said blandly. Well, if it has anything to do with chariots... The Golden Fleece, I said. We know where it is. The flames burned orange. Before Tantalus could stop me, I blurted out my dream about Grover and Polyphemus's island. Annabeth stepped in and reminded everybody what the fleece could do. It sounded more convincing coming from her. The fleece can save the camp, she concluded. I'm certain of it. Oh, nonsense, said Tantalus. We don't need saving. Everybody stared at him until Tantalus started looking uncomfortable. Besides, he added quickly, the sea of monsters? That's hardly an exact location. You wouldn't even know where to look. Yes. I would, I said. Annabeth leaned toward me and whispered, You would? I nodded because Annabeth had jogged something in my memory when she reminded me about our taxi drive with the Grey Sisters. At the time, the information they'd given me made no sense, but now... Thirty, thirty-one, seventy-five, twelve, I said. Okay, Tantalus said. Thank you for sharing those meaningless numbers. They're sailing coordinates, I said. Latitude and longitude. I uh, learned about it in social studies. Even Annabeth looked impressed. 30 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west. He's right. The Grey Sisters gave us those coordinates. That'd be somewhere in the Atlantic off the coast of Florida. The Sea of Monsters. We need a quest. Now wait just a minute, Tantalus said. But the campers took up the chant. We need a quest. We need a quest. The flames rose higher. It isn't necessary. Tantalus insisted. We need a quest! We need a quest! Fine! Tantalus shouted, his eyes blazing with anger. You brats want me to assign a quest! Yes! Very well, he agreed. I shall authorize a champion to undertake this perilous journey, to retrieve the Golden Fleece and bring it back to camp, or die trying. My heart filled with excitement. I wasn't going to let Tantalus scare me. This was what I needed to do. I was going to save Grover and the camp. Nothing would stop me. I will allow our champion to consult the oracle, Tantalus announced, and choose two companions for the journey. And I think the choice of champion is obvious. Tantalus looked at Annabeth and me as if he wanted to flay us alive. The champion should be the one who has earned the camp's respect, who has proven resourceful in the chariot races and courageous in the defense of the camp. You shall lead this quest, Clarice. The fire flickered a thousand different colors. The Ares cabin started stomping and cheering. 
Clarice! Clarice! Clarice stood up, looked stunned. Then she swallowed and her chest swelled with pride. I accept the quest. Wait! I shouted. Grover is my friend. The dream came to me. Sit down! yelled one of the Ares campers. You had your chance last summer. Yeah, he just wants to be in the spotlight again, another said. Clarice glared at me. I accept the quest, she repeated. I, Clarice, daughter of Ares, will save the camp. The Ares campers cheered even louder. Annabeth protested and the other Athena campers joined in. Everybody else started taking sides, shouting and arguing and throwing marshmallows. I thought it was going to turn into a full-fledged s'more war until Tantalus shouted, Silence, you brats! His tone stunned even me. Sit down, he ordered, and I will tell you a ghost story. I didn't know what he was up to, but we all moved reluctantly back to our seats. The evil aura radiating from Tantalus was as strong as any monster I'd ever faced. Once upon a time, there was a mortal king who was beloved of the gods. Tantalus put his hand on his chest, and I got the feeling he was talking about himself. This king, he said, was even allowed to feast on Mount Olympus. But when he tried to take some ambrosia and nectar back to Earth to figure out the recipe, just one little doggy bag, mind you, the gods punished him. They banned him from their halls forever. His own people mocked him. His children scolded him. And, oh yes, campers, he had horrible children. Children just like you. He pointed a crooked finger at several people in the audience, including me. Do you know what he did to his ungrateful children? Tantalus asked softly. Do you know how he paid back the gods for their cruel punishment? He invited the Olympians to a feast at his palace, just to show there was no hard feelings. No one noticed that his children were missing. And when he served the gods dinner, my dear campers, can you guess what was in the stew? No one dared answer. The firelight glowed dark blue, reflecting evilly on Tantalus's crooked face. Oh, the gods punished him in the afterlife, Tantalus croaked. They did indeed. But he'd had his moment of satisfaction, hadn't he? His children never again spoke back to him or questioned his authority. And do you know what? Rumor has it that the king's spirit now dwells at this very camp, waiting for a chance to take revenge on ungrateful, rebellious children. And so, are there any more complaints before we send Clarice off on her quest? Silence. Tantalus nodded at Clarice. The Oracle, my dear. Go on. She shifted uncomfortably, like even she didn't want glory at the price of being Tantalus's pet. Sir, go, he snarled. She bowed awkwardly and hurried off toward the big house. What about you, Percy Jackson? Tantalus asked. No comments from our dishwasher? I didn't say anything. I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of punishing me again. Good, Tantalus said, and let me remind everyone. No one leaves this camp without my permission. Anyone who tries, well, if they survive the attempt, they will be expelled forever, but it won't come to that. The Harpies will be enforcing curfew from now on, and they are always hungry. Good night, my dear campers. Sleep well. With a wave of Tantalus's hand, the fire was extinguished, and the campers trailed off toward their cabins in the dark. I couldn't explain things to Tyson. He knew I was sad. He knew I wanted to go on a trip, and Tantalus wouldn't let me. You will go anyway? he asked. I don't know, I admitted. It would be hard. Very hard. I will help. No, I... Uh, I couldn't ask you to do that, big guy. Too dangerous. Tyson looked down at the pieces of metal he was assembling in his lap. Springs and gears and tiny wires. Beckendorf had given him some tools and spare parts, and now Tyson spent every night tinkering, though I wasn't sure how his huge hands could handle such delicate little pieces. What are you building? I asked. Tyson didn't answer. Instead, he made a whimpering sound in the back of his throat. Annabeth doesn't like cyclopses. You don't want me along. Oh, that's not it, I said half-heartedly. Annabeth likes you, really. He had tears in the corners of his eye. I remember that Grover, like all satyrs, could read human emotions. I wondered if Cyclops has had the same ability. Tyson folded up his tinkering project in an oil cloth. He lay down on his bunk bed and hugged his bundle like a teddy bear. When he turned toward the wall, I could see the weird scars on his back, like somebody had plowed over him with a tractor. I wondered for the millionth time how he'd gotten hurt. 
Daddy always cared for Mimi, he sniffled. Now, I think he was mean to have a Cyclops boy. I should not have been born. Don't talk that way. Poseidon claimed you, didn't he? So, he must care about you. A lot. My voice trailed off as I thought about all those years Tyson had lived on the streets of New York in a cardboard refrigerator box. How could Tyson think that Poseidon cared for him? What kind of dad let that happen to his kid, even if his kid was a monster? Tyson, camp will be a good home for you. The others will get used to you, I promise. Tyson sighed. I waited for him to say something, then I realized he was already asleep. I lay back on my bed and tried to close my eyes, but I just couldn't. I was afraid he might have another dream about Grover. If the empathy link was real, if something happened to Grover, would I ever wake up? The full moon shone through my window. The sound of the surf rumbled in the distance. I could smell the warm scent of the strawberry fields and hear the laughter of the dryads as they chased owls through the forest, but something felt wrong about the night. The sickness of Thalia's tree spreading across the valley. Could Clarice save Half-Blood Hill? I thought the odds were better of me getting a Best Camper Award from Tantalus. I got out of bed and pulled on some clothes. I grabbed a beach blanket and a six-pack of coke from under my bunk. The cokes were against the rules. No outside snacks or drinks were allowed, but if you talked to the right guy in Hermes' cabin and paid him a few golden drachma, he could smuggle in almost anything from the nearest convenience store. Sinking out after curfew was against the rules, too. If I'd got caught, I'd either get in big trouble or be eaten by the harpies. But I wanted to see the ocean. I always felt better there. My thoughts were clearer. I left the cabin and headed for the beach. I spread my blanket near the surf and popped open a coke. For some reason, sugar and caffeine always calmed down my hyperactive brain. I tried to decide what to do to save the camp, but nothing came to me. I wish Poseidon would talk to me, give me some advice or something. The sky was clear and starry. I was checking out the constellations Annabeth had taught me, Sagittarius, Hercules, Corona Borealis, when somebody said, Beautiful, aren't they? I almost spewed soda. Standing right next to me was a guy in nylon running shorts and a New York City Marathon t-shirt. He was slim and fit, with salt and pepper hair and a sly smile. He looked kind of familiar, but I couldn't figure out why. My first thought was that he must have been taking a midnight jog down the beach and straight inside the camp borders. That wasn't supposed to happen. Regular mortals couldn't enter the valley. But maybe with the tree's magic weakening, he'd managed to slip in. But in the middle of the night, there was nothing around except farmland and state preserves. Where would this guy have jogged from? May I join you? He asked. I haven't sat down in ages. Now, I know. A strange guy in the middle of the night. Common sense, I was supposed to run away, yell for help, etc. But the guy acted so calm about the whole thing that I found it hard to be afraid. I said, uh, sure. He smiled. Your hospitality does you credit. Oh, and Coca-Cola. May I? He sat at the other end of the blanket, popped a soda, and took a drink. Ah. Uh. That hits the spot. Peace and quiet at... A cell phone went off in his pocket. The jogger sighed. He pulled out his phone and my eyes got big because it glowed with a bluish light. When he extended the antenna, two creatures began writhing around it. Green snakes no bigger than earthworms. The jogger didn't seem to notice. He checked his LCD display and cursed. I've got to take this. Just a sec. Then into the phone. Hello? He listened. The mini snakes writhed up and down the antenna right next to his ear. Yeah. The jogger said. Listen, I know, but I don't care if he is chained to a rock with vultures pecking at his liver. If he doesn't have a tracking number, we can't locate his package. A gift to humankind, great. You know how many of those we deliver? Oh, never mind. Listen, just refer him to Eris in customer service. I gotta go. He hung up. Sorry. The overnight express business is just booming. Now, as I was saying, you have snakes on your phone. What? Oh. They don't bite. Say hello, George and Martha. Hello, George and Martha, a raspy male voice said inside my head. Don't be sarcastic, said a female voice. Why not, George demanded. I do all the real work. No, oh, let's not get into that again. The jogger slipped his phone back into his pocket. Now, where were we? Ah, yes. Peace and quiet. He crossed his ankles and stared up at the stars. Been a long time since I've gotten to relax. Ever since the telegraph, rush, rush, rush. Do you have a favorite constellation, Percy? I was still kind of wondering about the little green snakes he'd shoved into his jogging shorts, but I said, Uh, I like Hercules. Why? Well, because he had rotten luck. Even worse than mine. Makes me feel better. The jogger chuckled. 
not because he was strong and famous and all that? No. You're an interesting young man. And so, what now? I knew immediately what he was asking. What did I intend to do about the fleece? Before I could answer, Martha the Snake's muffled voice came from his pocket. I have Demeter on line two. Not now, the jogger said. Tell her to leave a message. She's not going to like that. The last time you put her off, all the flowers in the floral delivery division wilted. Just tell her I'm in a meeting. The jogger rolled his eyes. Sorry, again, Percy. You were saying... Um, who are you, exactly? Haven't you guessed by now, a smart boy like you? Show him, Martha pleaded. I haven't been full size for months. Oh, don't listen to her, George said. She just wants to show off. The man took out his phone again. Original form, please. The phone glowed a brilliant blue. It stretched into a three-foot-long wooden staff with dove wings sprouting out the top. George and Martha, now full-sized green snakes, coiled together around the middle. It was a catechus, the symbol of Cabin Eleven. My throat tightened. I realized who the jogger reminded me of with his elfish features, the mischievous twinkle in his eyes. You're Luke's father, I said. Hermes. The god pursed his lips. He stuck his catechus in the sand like an umbrella pole. Luke's father. Normally, that's not the first way people introduce me. God of thieves, yes. God of messengers and travelers, if they wish to be kind. <laughs> god of thieves works, George said. Oh, don't mind George, Martha flicked her tongue at me. He's just bitter because Hermes likes me best. He does not. Does too. Behave, you two, Hermes warned, or I'll turn you back into a cell phone and set you on vibrate. Now, Percy, you still haven't answered my question. What do you intend to do about the quest? I... I don't have permission to go. No, indeed. Will that stop you? I want to go. I have to save Grover. Hermes smiled. I knew a boy once. Oh, younger than you by far. A mere baby, really. Here we go again, George said, always talking about himself. Quiet, Martha snapped. Do you want to get set on vibrate? Hermes ignored them. One night, when this boy's mother wasn't watching, he sneaked out of their cave and stole some cattle that belonged to Apollo. Did he get blasted into tiny pieces? I asked. <laughs> no. Actually, everything turned out quite well. To make up for his theft, the boy gave Apollo an instrument he'd invented. A lyre. Apollo was so enchanted with the music that he'd forgot all about being angry. So what's the moral? The moral? Hermes asked. Goodness, you act like it's a fable. It's a true story. Does truth have a moral? Um, how about this? Stealing is not always bad? I don't think my mom would like that moral. Rats are delicious, suggested George. What does that have to do with the story? Martha demanded. Nothing, George said, but I'm hungry. I've got it, Hermes said. Young people don't always do what they're told, but if they can pull it off and do something wonderful, sometimes they escape punishment. How's that? You're saying I should go anyway, I said, even without permission? Hermes' eyes twinkled. Martha, may I have the first package, please? Martha opened her mouth and kept opening it until it was as wide as my arm. She belched out a stainless steel canister, an old-fashioned lunchbox thermos with a black plastic top. The sides of the thermos were enameled with red and yellow ancient Greek scenes, a hero killing a lion, a hero lifting up Cerberus, the three-headed dog. That's Hercules, I said. But how? Never questioned a gift, Hermes chided. This is a collector's item from Hercules Bust Heads, the first season. Hercules Bust Heads? Great show, Hermes sighed, back before Hephaestus TV was all reality programming. Of course, the thermos would be worth much more if I had the whole lunchbox. Or if it hadn't been in Martha's mouth, George added. I'll get you for that, Martha began chasing him around the catechus. Wait a minute, I said. This is a gift? One of two, Hermes said. Go on, pick it up. I almost dropped it because it was freezing cold on one side and burning hot on the other. The weird thing was when I turned the thermos, the side facing the ocean north was always the cold side. It's a compass, I said. Hermes looked surprised. Very clever. I never thought of that. But its intended use is a bit more dramatic. Uncap it, and you will release the winds from the four corners of the earth to speed you on your way. Not now. 
And please, when the time comes, only unscrew the lid a tiny bit. The winds are a bit like me, always restless. Should all four escape at once, ah, but I'm sure you'll be careful. And now my second gift, George. She's touching me, George complained as he and Martha slithered around the pole. She's always touching you, Hermes said. You're intertwined, and if you don't stop that, you'll get knotted again. The snake stopped wrestling. George unhinged his jaw and coughed up a little plastic bottle filled with chewable vitamins. You're kidding, I said. Are those minotaur shaped? Hermes picked up the bottle and rattled it. The lemon ones, yes. The grape ones are furies, I think. Or are they hydras? At any rate, these are potent. Don't take one unless you really, really need it. How will I know if I really, really need it? You'll know, believe me. Nine essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, oh, everything you need to feel yourself again. He tossed me the bottle. Um, thanks, I said. But Lord Hermes, why are you helping me? He gave me a melancholy smile. Perhaps because I hope that you can save many people on this quest, Percy. Not just your friend Grover. I stared at him. You don't mean Luke. Hermes didn't answer. Look, I said. Lord Hermes, I mean, thanks and everything, but you might as well take back your gifts. Luke can't be saved, even if I could find him. He told me he wanted to tear down Olympus stone by stone. He betrayed everybody he knew. He, he hates you especially. Hermes gazed up at the stars. My dear young cousin, if there's one thing I've learned over the eons, it's that you can't give up on your family, no matter how tempting they make it. It doesn't matter if they hate you or embarrass you or simply don't appreciate your genius for inventing the internet. You invented the internet? It was my idea, Martha said. Rats are delicious, George said. It was my idea, Hermes said. I mean, the internet, not the rats. But that's not the point. Percy, do you understand what I'm saying about family? I... I'm not sure. You will someday. Hermes got up and brushed the sand off his legs. In the meantime, I must be going. You have sixty calls to return, Martha said. And one thousand eight emails, George added, not counting the offers for online discount ambrosia. And you, Percy, Hermes said, have a shorter deadline than you realize to complete your quest. Your friend should be coming right about now. I heard Annabeth's voice calling my name from the sand dunes. Tyson, too, was shouting from a little bit further away. I hope I packed well for you, Hermes said. I do have some experience with travel. He snapped his fingers and three yellow duffel bags appeared at my feet. Waterproof, of course. If you ask nicely, your father should be able to help you reach the ship. Ship? Hermes pointed. Sure enough, a big cruise ship was cutting across Long Island Sound, its white and gold lights glowing against the dark water. Wait, I said. I don't understand any of this. I haven't even agreed to go. I'd make up your mind in the next five minutes if I were you, Hermes advised. That's when the harpies will come to eat you. Now, good night, cousin. And dare I say it, may the gods go with you. He opened his hand and the catechist flew into it. Good luck, Martha told me. Bring me back a rat, George said. The catechist changed into a cell phone and Hermes slipped it into his pocket. He jogged off down the beach. Twenty paces away, he shimmered and vanished, leaving me alone with the thermos, a bottle of chewable vitamins, and five minutes to make an impossible decision. Chapter 8. We board the Princess Andromeda. I was staring at the waves when Annabeth and Tyson found me. What's going on? Annabeth asked. I heard you calling for help. Me too, Tyson said. Heard you yell. Bad things are attacking. I didn't call you guys, I said. I'm fine. But then who? Annabeth noticed the three yellow duffel bags, then the thermos and the bottle of vitamins I was holding. What? Uh, just listen, I said. We don't have much time. I told them about my conversation with Hermes. By the time I was finished, I could hear screeching in the distance, patrol harpies picking up our scent. Percy, Annabeth said, we have to do the quest. We'll get expelled, you know. Trust me, I'm an expert at getting expelled. So, if we fail, there won't be any camp to come back to. Yeah, but you promised Chiron. I promised I'd keep you from danger. I can only do that by coming with you. Tyson can stay behind and tell them I want to go, Tyson said. No! Annabeth's voice sounded close to panic. I mean, Percy, come on, you know that's impossible. I wondered again why she had such a grudge against Cyclopses. There was something she wasn't telling me. She and Tyson both looked at me, waiting for an answer. Meanwhile, the cruise ship was getting farther and farther away. The thing was, part of me didn't want Tyson along. 
I had spent the last three days in close quarters with the guy, getting razzed by the other campers and embarrassed a million times a day, constantly reminded that I was related to him. I needed some space. Plus, I didn't know how much help he'd be or how I'd keep him safe. Sure, he was strong, but Tyson was a little kid in Cyclops terms, maybe seven or eight years old mentally. I could see him freaking out and starting to cry while we were trying to sneak past a monster or something. He'd get us all killed. On the other hand, the sound of the harpies was getting closer. We can't leave him, I decided. Tantalus will punish him for us being gone. Percy, Anubis said, trying to keep her cool. We're going to Polyphemus' island. Polyphemus is an S-I-K... A C-Y-K... She stamped her foot in frustration. As smart as she was, Annabeth was dyslexic, too. We could have been there all night while she tried to spell Cyclops. You know what I mean. Tyson can go, I insisted, if he wants to. Tyson clapped his hands. Want to. Annabeth gave me the evil eye, but I guess she could tell I wasn't going to change my mind. Or maybe she just knew we didn't have time to argue. All right, she said. How do we get to the ship? Hermes said my father would help. Well then, seaweed brain, what are you waiting for? I'd always had a hard time calling on my father, or praying, or whatever you want to call it, but I stepped into the waves. Um, Dad, I called. How's it going? Percy, Annabeth whispered. We're in a hurry. We need your help, I called a little louder. We need to get to that ship, like, before we get eaten and stuff, so... At first, nothing happened. Waves crashed against the shore like normal. The harpies sounded like they were right behind the sand dunes. Then, about a hundred yards out to sea, three white lines appeared on the surface. They moved fast toward the shore like claws ripping through the ocean. As they neared the beach, the surf burst apart and the heads of three white stallions reared out of the waves. Tyson caught his breath. Fish ponies! He was right. <laughs> As the creatures pulled themselves onto the sand, I saw they were only horses in the front. Their back halves were silvery fish bodies with glistening scales and rainbow tail fins. Hippocampy, Annabeth said. They're beautiful. The nearest one whined in appreciation and nuzzled Annabeth. We'll admire them later, I said. Come on. There, a voice screeched behind us. Bad children out of cabins. Snack time for lucky harpies. Five of them were fluttering over the top of the dunes, plump little hags with pinched faces and talons and feathery wings too small for their bodies. They reminded me of miniature cafeteria ladies who had been crossbred with dodo birds. They weren't very fast, thank the gods, but they were vicious if they caught you. Tyson, I said. Grab a duffel bag. He was still staring at the hippocampy with his mouth hanging open. Tyson! Oh, come on! With Annabeth's help, I got him moving. We gathered the bags and mounted our steeds. Poseidon must have known Tyson was one of the passengers because one hippocampus was much larger than the other two, just right for carrying a cyclops. Giddy up, I said. My hippocampus turned and plunged into the waves. Annabeth and Tyson's followed right behind. The harpies cursed at us, wailing for their snacks to come back, but the hippocampy raced over the water at the speed of jet skis, the harpies fell behind, and soon the shore of Camp Half-Blood was nothing but a dark smudge. I wondered if I'd ever see the place again, but right then I had other problems. The cruise ship was now looming in front of us, our ride toward Florida and the Sea of Monsters. Riding the hippocampus was even easier than riding a pegasus. We zipped along with the wind in our faces, speeding through the waves so smooth and steady I hardly needed to hold on at all. As we got closer to the cruise ship, I realized just how huge it was. I felt as though I was looking up at a building in Manhattan. The white hall was at least ten stories tall, topped with another dozen levels of decks with brightly lit balconies and portholes. The ship's name was painted just above the bow line in black letters, lit with a spotlight. It took me a few seconds to decipher it. Princess Andromeda. Attached to the bow was a huge masthead, a three-story tall woman wearing a white Greek chiton, sculpted to look as if she were chained to the front of the ship. She was young and beautiful with flowing black hair, but her expression was one of absolute terror. Why anybody would want a screaming princess on the front of their vacation ship? I had no idea. I remembered the myth about Andromeda and how she'd been chained to a rock by her own parents as a sacrifice to a sea monster. Maybe she'd gotten too many Fs on her report card or something. Anyway, my namesake, Perseus, had saved her just in time and turned the sea monster to stone using the head of Medusa. That Perseus always won. That's why my mom had named me after him, even though he was a son of Zeus and I was a son of Poseidon. The original Perseus was one of the only heroes in the Greek myths who got a happy ending. The others died, betrayed, mauled, mutilated, poisoned, or cursed by the gods. My mom hoped I would inherit Perseus's luck. Judging by how my life was going so far, I wasn't real optimistic. How do we get aboard? Annabeth shouted over the noise of the waves, but the hippocampies seemed to know what we needed. They skimmed along the starboard side of the ship, riding easily through its huge wake, and pulled up next to a service ladder riveted to the side of the hull. You first, I told Annabeth. She slung her duffel bag over her shoulder and grabbed the bottom rung. Once she'd hoisted herself onto the ladder, her hippocampus whinnied a farewell and dove underwater. 
Annabeth began to climb. I let her get a few rungs up, then followed her. Finally, it was just Tyson in the water. His hippocampus was treating him to 360 aerials and backward ollies, and Tyson was laughing so hysterically the sound echoed up the side of the ship. Tyson, shh, I said. Come on, big guy. Can't we take Rainbow? He asked, his smile fading. I stared at him. Rainbow? The hippocampus whinnied as if he liked his new name. Um, we have to go, I said. Rainbow, well, he can't climb ladders. Tyson sniffled. He buried his face in the hippocampus's mane. I will miss you, Rainbow. The hippocampus made a neighing sound I could have sworn was crying. Maybe we'll see him again sometime, I suggested. Oh, please, Tyson said, perking up immediately. Tomorrow. I didn't make any promises, but I finally convinced Tyson to say his farewells and grab hold of the ladder. With a final sad whinny, Rainbow the hippocampus did a backflip and dove into the sea. The ladder led to a maintenance deck stacked with yellow lifeboats. There was a set of locked double doors, which Annabeth managed to pry open with her knife and a fair amount of cursing in ancient Greek. I figured we'd have to sneak around, being stowaways and all, but after checking a few corridors and peering over a balcony into a huge central promenade lined with closed shops, I began to realize there was nobody to hide from. I mean, sure, it was the middle of the night, but we walked half the length of the boat and met no one. We passed 40 or 50 cabin doors and heard no sound behind any of them. It's a ghost ship, I murmured. No, Tyson said, fiddling with the strap of his duffel bag. Bad smell. Annabeth frowned. I don't smell anything. Cyclopses are like satyrs, I said. They can smell monsters. Isn't that right, Tyson? He nodded nervously. Now that we were away from Camp Half-Blood, the mist had distorted his face again. Unless I concentrated very hard, it seemed that he had two eyes instead of one. Okay, Annabeth said. So what exactly do you smell? Something bad, Tyson answered. Great, Annabeth grumbled. That clears it up. We came outside the swimming pool level. There were rows of empty deck chairs and a bar closed off with a chain curtain. The water in the pool glowed eerily, sloshing back and forth from the motion of the ship. Above us, fore and aft, were more levels. A climbing wall, a putt-putt golf course, a revolving restaurant, but no sign of life. And yet, I sensed something familiar, something dangerous. I had the feeling that if I weren't so tired and burned out on adrenaline from a long night, I might be able to put a name to what was wrong. We need a hiding place, I said. Somewhere safe to sleep. Sleep, Annabeth agreed wearily. We explored a few more corridors until we found an empty suite on the ninth level. The door was open, which struck me as weird. There was a basket of chocolate goodies on the table, an iced down bottle of sparkling cider on the nightstand, and a mint on the pillow with a head-ridden note that said, Enjoy your cruise. We opened our duffel bags for the first time and found that Hermes really had thought of everything. Extra clothes, toiletries, camp rations, a Ziploc bag full of cash, a leather pouch full of golden drachmas. He'd even managed to pack Tyson's oilcloth with his tools and metal bits, and Annabeth's cap of invisibility, which made them both feel a lot better. I'll be next door, Annabeth said. You guys don't drink or eat anything. You think this place is enchanted? She frowned. I don't know. Something isn't right. Just be careful. We locked our doors. Tyson crashed on the couch. He tinkered for a few minutes on his metalworking project, which he still wouldn't show me, but soon enough he was yawning. He wrapped up his oilcloth and passed out. I lay on the bed and stared at the porthole. I thought I heard voices out in the hallway, like whispering. I knew that couldn't be. We'd walked all over the ship and had seen nobody, but the voices kept me awake. They reminded me of my trip to the underworld, the way the spirits of the dead sounded as they drifted past. Finally, my weariness got the best of me. I fell asleep and had my worst dream yet. I was standing in a cavern at the edge of an enormous pit. I knew the place too well, the entrance to Tartarus, and I recognized the cold laugh that echoed from the darkness below. If it isn't the young hero. The voice was like a knife blade scraping across stone. On his way to another great victory. I wanted to shout at Cronus to leave me alone. I wanted to draw Riptide and strike him down, but I couldn't move. E even if I could, how could I kill something that had already been destroyed? chopped to pieces and cast into internal darkness. Oh, don't let me stop you, the titan said. Perhaps this time when you fail, you wonder if it's worthwhile slaving for the gods. How exactly has your father shown his appreciation lately? His laughter filled the cavern, and suddenly the scene changed. It was a different cave, Grover's bedroom prison in the Cyclops' lair. Grover was sitting at the loom in his soiled wedding dress, madly unraveling the threads of the unfinished bridal train. Honey pie, the monster shouted from behind the boulder. Grover yelped and began weaving the threads back together. The room shook as the boulder was pushed aside. Looming in the doorway was a cyclops so huge he made Tyson look vertically challenged. 
He had jagged yellow teeth and gnarled hands as big as my whole body. He wore a faded purple t-shirt that said World Sheep Expo 2001. He must have been at least 15 feet tall, but the most startling thing was his enormous milky eye, scarred and webbed with cataracts. If he wasn't completely blind, he had to be pretty darn close. What are you doing? The monster demanded. Nothing, Grover said in his falsetto voice. Just waving my bridal train, as you can see. <laughs> the cyclops struck one hand into the room and groped around until he found the loom. He pawed at the cloth. It hasn't gotten any longer. Um, um, yes, it has, dearest. See, I've added at least an inch. <sighs> Too many delays, the monster bellowed. Then he sniffed the air. You smell good, like goats. Oh, Grover forced a weak giggle. <laughs> Do you like it? It's a de chirve. I wore it just for you. Mmm, the cyclops bared his pointed teeth. Good enough to eat. Oh, you're such a flirt. No more delays. But dear, I'm not done. Tomorrow. Uh, no, no, ten more days. Five. Oh, well, seven then, if you insist. Seven. That is less than five, right? Certainly. Oh, yes. The monster grumbled, still not happy with his deal, but he left Grover to his weaving and rolled the boulder back into place. Grover closed his eyes and took a shaky breath, trying to calm his nerves. Hurry, Percy, he muttered. Please, please, please. I woke to a ship's whistle and a voice on the intercom, some guy with an Australian accent who sounded way too happy. Good morning, passengers. <laughs> That's not Australian. <laughs> we'll be at sea all day today. Excellent weather for the poleside mambo party. Don't forget Million Dollar Bingo in the Kraken Lounge at one o'clock, and for our special guest, disemboweling practice on the promenade. I sat up in bed. What did he say? Tyson groaned, still half asleep. He was lying face down on the couch, his feet so far over the edge they were in the bathroom. The happy man said, bowling practice. I hoped he was right, but then there was an urgent knock on the suite's interior door. Annabeth stuck her head in, her blonde hair in a rat's nest. Disemboweling practice? Once we were all dressed, we ventured out into the ship and were surprised to see other people. A dozen senior citizens were heading to breakfast. A dad was taking his kids to the pool for a morning swim. Crew members in crisp white uniforms strolled the deck, tipping their hats to the passengers. Nobody asked who we were. Nobody paid as much attention, but there was something wrong. <laughs> as the family of swimmers passed us, the dad told his kids, We are on a cruise. We are having fun. Yes, his three kids said in unison, their expressions blank. We are having a blast. We will swim in the pool. They wandered off. Good morning, a crew member told us, his eyes glazed. We are all enjoying ourselves aboard the Princess Andromeda. Have a nice day. He drifted away. Percy, this is weird, Annabeth whispered. They're all in some kind of trance. Then we passed a cafeteria and saw our first monster. It was a hellhound, a black mastiff with its front paws up on the buffet line and its muzzle buried in the scrambled eggs. It must have been young because it was small compared to most, no bigger than a grizzly bear. Still, my blood turned cold. I'd almost gotten killed by one of those before. The weird thing was, a middle-aged couple was standing in the buffet line right behind the devil dog, patiently waiting for their turn for eggs. They didn't seem to notice anything out of the ordinary. Not hungry anymore, Tyson murmured. Before Annabeth or I could reply, a reptilian voice came from down the corridor. Six more joined yesterday. Annabeth gestured frantically toward the nearest hiding place, the women's room, and all three of us ducked inside. I was so freaked out it didn't even occur to me to be embarrassed. Something, or more like two somethings, slithered past the bathroom door, making sounds like sandpaper against the carpet. Yes, a second reptilian voice said. He draws them. Soon we will be strong. The thing slithered into the cafeteria with a cold hissing that might have been snake laughter. Annabeth looked at me. We have to get out of here. <laughs> you think I want to be in the girls' restroom? I mean the ship, Percy. We have to get off the ship. Smells bad, Tyson agreed. And dogs eat all the egg. Annabeth is right. We must leave the restroom and the ship. I shuddered. If Annabeth and Tyson were actually agreeing about something, I figured I'd better listen. Then I heard another voice outside. One that chilled me worse than any monsters. <laughs> Only a matter of time. Don't push me, Agrius. It was Luke, beyond a doubt. I could never forget his voice. I'm not pushing you, another guy growled. His voice was deeper and even angrier than Luke's. I'm just saying, if this gamble doesn't pay off... It'll pay off, Luke snapped. They'll take the bait. Now come on, we've got to get to the Admiralty suit and check on the casket. 
Their voices receded down the corridor. Tyson whimpered. Leave now? Annabeth and I exchanged looks and came to a silent agreement. We can't, I told Tyson. We have to find out what Luke is up to, Annabeth agreed. And if possible, we're going to beat him up, bind him in chains, and drag him to Mount Olympus. And that's where I'm going to leave it off for today. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of What a Book. If you liked it, make sure to let me know uh, by reaching out to me over on my social medias in the link down in the description. I have Twitter, I have Instagram, and that is all. Uh, if you feel so inclined, check out everything else that I do down in that description. You'll find the gaming YouTube, you'll find the Twitch. Uh, you'll also probably find that I've got some other things, you know. There's Percy Jackson Olympians, The Lightning Thief. There's also the podcast. Well, there's plenty of stuff for you to check out. So thank you guys so much for listening. I've been Matthew Allen. This has been part three of The Sea of Monsters. And I'll see all of you next week.